Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to your bonus podcast on Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Why am I doing this? It's because we've just got so much material to cover in the Kingdom Come series that uh, I can't fit it into the classes that we have. And so I'll mention a few things about this section on this coming Friday, the 7th of February, in the class that's coming, but um, we can't do, deal with it in enough detail. So I'm recording this extra bonus podcast video so that we can hopefully get uh, as much as we can out of it, because it's an important section of Scripture. Let's read it and then see what we can learn from it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Power-packed few verses right here. This paragraph is really interesting and contains perhaps some of the most difficult verses in all of the Bible, let alone the Sermon on the Mount. What is it about? Well, it's about the kingdom, as Jesus has been talking about quite a lot already in Matthew 5. It's about the kingdom of heaven and entry into the kingdom of heaven. It's here at the beginning, or uh, or rather partway through Matthew chapter 5, which is going to set up the next five blocks of teaching, which we'll talk about in in the class on Friday. And he's emphasizing that his teachings are in harmony with the Old Testament scriptures, then emphasizing that his teachings are in disharmony with the teachings of the Pharisees, teachers of the law, and all those kinds of people contemporary with Jesus. We have two sections. First, in in these verses, Christ and the law, verses 17 and 18. And secondly, Christ and and, uh, the Christian and the law, verses 19 and 20. The first half of this paragraph addresses those tempted to put the law to one side. The second section confronts those preoccupied with literal observance, and they miss the point of fulfillment of the law. The visionary point here is not only that Jesus fulfills the law, but that he's its only authoritative interpreter and that he is present and he is doing so in front of the people listening to him. What a gift it is for his hearers if they will only hear what he has to say. Now I'm going to go through the rest of this section just verse by verse. I'm going to go through it in a teaching manner. I'm not going to try and make it structured except just to follow the text. I decided to do it this more Uh, text-focused and technical way simply because it's a teaching video rather more than a class taught to a group. So I hope you find this useful. Hang with me as we go through these verses. So first of all, the structure. It's interesting that he talks about the law and the prophets here, as he does in Matthew 7 verse 12, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. It seems from here, to Matthew 7, 12 is all one, in in one sense, one way of expressing all of what it means that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Do to others as you would have them do to you, summarizing all of this. So we've got an inclusio, it's called here, between Matthew 5, verse 17 and Matthew 7, verse 12, talking about the law and the prophets here, and then the law and the prophets in Matthew 7, verse 12. What does he say? He says, I have come. I have come. He's on a mission. He's on a mission, fulfilling the Old Testament predictive prophecies about him, amongst many other things. And what has he come to do? Well, they say he's come to abolish. Some people think that. Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Um, mind you, he did abolish the food laws in Mark seven nineteen, perhaps, did he? And what about the fact that according to Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, The sacrificial system is no longer needed after Jesus has come, died and on the cross and resurrected. So did he not come to abolish or did he come to abolish? What's going on here? At least part of what's going on is that he's answering a question that undoubtedly other people were asking of him. 
His lifestyle, his teaching gave at least some people the impression that he was advocating the abolition of the law and the teachings of the prophets. It makes us think about whether the way that we live our Christian life might make people wonder whether we're really Christian, at least in their traditional understanding of what it means to be a Christian. But that's, that's a bit of a side point. The law and the prophets. The prophets taught the law, they applied it, and they I interpreted it. Now this, I would say, since uh, Jesus is saying that he hasn't come to abolish them but to fulfil them, this surely is at least uh, an incentive for us Christians to study the Old Testament. How can we understand Jesus if we don't understand what he is fulfilling and what he believed in? The early church valued the Old Testament. There's so many quotes from it in the New Testament and in the writings of the early church. The book of Hebrews is almost incomprehensible unless we understand the Old Testament. So just in case you've been thinking that the Old Testament isn't that important, I would say rethink that and look at the Old Testament as, as being critical to understanding Jesus. A chap called Bishop Ryle summed it up quite well. He said, the Old Testament is the gospel in the bud. The New Testament is the gospel in full flower. But that bud and that flower are one and the same plant, or from one and the same plant, you could say. The law. What law is he referring to here when he talks about not uh, coming to abolish it? Some say that the law has three parts. Thomas Aquinas said that it was uh, civil, ceremonial and moral. Perhaps Jesus is saying he upholds the moral law since the ceremonial will become obsolete after his sacrifice and the civil will no longer hold because the church is not a nation in the same way that Israel was. The problem with that is, as many commentators would say, that not not come to abolish you know uh, not one what is it one not the smallest letter not one least stroke of a of the pen will disappear that sounds it sounds too all encompassing to allow for the distinctions in different parts of the law maybe and in a sense you could argue that all of god's commands whether ceremonial or not are moral in the sense they are part of him from him i'd like to know what you think he's come to fulfill them oh what an interesting word Fulfill. Let's talk about fulfill for a moment. Literally, you could translate it as to fill to the full. So perhaps what Jesus is saying here, he's come to not abolish the law and the prophets, but to fill up the law and the prophets to the full, to their fullness, to the fullness of what it means, completeness perhaps, maybe confirming the law and the prophets. As somebody said, what the law really means is confirmed by the lives of both Jesus he lived the perfect life, so fulfilled the law in that way, and his disciples, who fulfilled the law via the medium of the Spirit, Romans 8, 4. Others would say the language doesn't seem to be that vague. Perhaps it cannot mean to simply fully, fully obey the law. Um, if you read it here as, I've not come to abolish the law but to on the prophets, but to obey it, is that it? But obey seems too narrow because he came, Jesus came as who he was, as Messiah, as the living word. So something more seems to be implied. Hagner says in his word, Biblical Commentary, the teaching of Jesus by definition amounts to the true meaning of the Torah and is hence paradoxical, uh, paradoxically an affirmation of Jesus' loyalty to the Old Testament. Jesus defines righteousness by expounding the true meaning of the law as opposed to the wrong or shallow understandings. Uh, and it's best to understand fulfill here as meaning bring to its intended meaning. That is, to present a definitive interpretation of the law, something now possible because of the presence of the Messiah and his kingdom. Far from destroying the law, Jesus' teachings, despite their occasionally strange sound, penetrate to the divinely intended, in other words, the teleological meaning of the law. Because the law and the prophets pointed to him and he is their goal, he is now able, he is able now to reveal their true meaning and so to bring them to fulfillment. This view is consonant with the expectation that the Messiah would not only preserve the Torah, but also bring out its meaning in a definitive manner. Hagner again there. Other people suggest that Jesus fulfills the prophets by appearing as Messiah and fulfills the law by dying as the perfect sacrifice. Jesus, uh, it, elsewhere, Matthew records in Matthew 11 verse 12, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. It seems that both law and prophets had a prophetic function in the mind of Jesus. Some of that prophecy is direct, some is 
indirect and some is allusionary. Carson says, the New Testament interprets, interprets the Old as pointing forward to Christ and the blessings he brings. Hmm. The New Testament interprets the Old. The sacrifices are fulfilled in the cross and everything points towards him. Math, uh, Luke 24. Carson again. In other words, Jesus does not conceive of his life and ministry in terms of opposition to the Old Testament, but in terms of bringing to fruition that toward which it points. Who else do we have here? Lloyd-Jones said this, the real meaning of the word fulfill is to carry out, to fulfill in the sense of giving full obedience to it, literally carrying out everything that has been said and stated in the law and the prophets. Perhaps Jesus fulfilled the law in his death, the ceremonial law, and in forming a new community, fulfilling the judicial law, and his relationships with God and others, as in the moral law. That's Lloyd-Jones again. Who else do we have here? R.T. France. Among the many nuances suggested for the word fulfill, the following are the main options. A. To accomplish and obey. B. To bring out the full meaning. C. To complete or to bring to its destined end. By giving the final revelation of God's will to which the Old Testament pointed forward and which now transcends it. Christ, the end of the law. Both completing the law and transcending it. France says it's doubtful if any single translation or even paraphrase can do justice to the word here, but perhaps fulfill uh, points in the right direction. The best interpretation of these difficult verses says that Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets in that they point to him and he is their fulfillment. The antithesis is not between abolish and keep, but between, uh, but between abolish and keep, but between abolish and fulfill. For Matthew then, it is not the question of Jesus' relation to the law that's in doubt, but rather its relation to him. I like that thought there. That's Carson again. One last quote from Carson from his commentary on Matthew, uh, Expositor's Biblical Commentary. Here Jesus presents himself as the eschatological goal of the Old Testament and thereby its sole authoritative interpreter, the one through whom alone the Old Testament finds its valid continuity and significance. Mm. Jesus came to fulfill the law, to bring to completion. And that seems to be what's going on here. So Matthew 5, 18 now. Truly I tell you, an amen, amen. Unique to Jesus, uh, this word, uh, used in this way, amen. Used 31 times in Matthew, in fact. Until, it, uh, until heaven and earth disappear, it, the smallest letter, the least stroke of a pen, will not disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Never as long as the present world order persists. Have a look at Second Peter 3 and Revelation chapter 21, if you like. I think what he's basically saying is uh, nothing's going to change until, uh, it's, like, it's like saying until, hev until hell freezes over. It's an expression rather than saying something literal about time, I would say. The smallest letter, those tiny little uh, marks in, in Hebrew. Jesus is using the language of the Pharisees to make the hyperbolic point that he's the, th the authority for interpreting the Torah, not them. The law, until, until, there's an emphasis here, the word until is used twice, until everything is accomplished, until what it looks forward to arise. In other words, Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament the Old Covenant. Matthew 5.19, Therefore, he says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside the least, one of the least of these commands teaches others accordingly, least in the kingdom of heaven, but he who practices and teaches them, great in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, therefore, because the law remains valid and is fulfilled in Jesus, so let's not set aside anything. Um, it, it's uh, interesting that he says here, uh, sets aside the word literally means untie uh, don't untie these laws these commands which commands is he talking about well i'd like to know what you think different people have different ideas which when he says the least of these commands is he talking about the old testament laws and, and what the prophets said or is he talking about his own commands from the sermon on the mount for example carson in one of his writings, thinks that the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount uh, teaching that follow is what he's talking about. And that's because Jesus is talking now about the kingdom of heaven. If he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, you'd think he's talking about his own teachings. It's being inaugurated. Uh, 
and it's growing from, although it's distinct from the Old Testament law and the prophets, it's, it's growing out of it, but it is his teaching. However, in another one of his writings, he appears to say something different, that he, he thinks it's the Old Testament scriptures, as does France in the New International Commentary on the New Testament. Jesus is fulfilling all that pointed to him, and he is expounding on the true meaning by saying, but I tell you, and he is, he is saying, perhaps, that you must not uh, neglect the teaching of the Old Testament, where it, I suppose, relevant still. And Jesus does reiterate some of the Old Testament commands. So perhaps what we need to do is have a look at what he reinforced as opposed to what he reinterpreted accurately and correctly as being the way that we live in the New Covenant now that he has come to fulfill the law. If, if it's about him, if it's about the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is making a very strong statement about the authority of his teaching and the requirement to obey it. It's emphasized elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount itself that we must take his words seriously, as seriously, perhaps you could say more seriously even, than the Old Testament. Matthew 5 verses 20, 22, 26, 28, 32, 34, 39, 44, chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 are all about paying attention to and obeying his commands. And of course Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says that again right at the very end. Those who practice and teach the commands Hmm. Presumably he means practiced as they were intended to be practiced. Teach and do, in a sense like faith and works, or 1 Timothy 4.16, life and doctrine. Then who are the least in the kingdom? Who are the least in the kingdom? Uh, the saved or not? Perhaps those who are in the kingdom, but later condemned by their faithlessness, like the one talent hiding servant, perhaps. Or perhaps this is about a quality of discipleship rather than ultimate rewards. Luke 12, 47 to 48. I'd like to know what you think about that. And again, he mentions the kingdom. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is now come. And Jesus has come to fulfill the law and the prophets. So we too must be loyal to Yahweh, must obey the commands given by Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount in the specific context in the kingdom. Now the kingdom is emphasized here. It's mentioned three times in these verses. Verse 20, the final verse of this section. But for I tell you that unless, you, this is an expectation for his followers. It's you, plural here, it's for you, it's for me too. Our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. What on earth? Righteousness, this righteousness has arrived, this that he's talking about uh, via his life and teaching, Romans 3, 21. It's quite a demand, isn't it? It's got to exceed that of the Pharisees. I don't think I can do that. I don't think that's quite his point. It's not about a, a standard we must uh, live up to as such. It's about, well, look back at the Beatitudes. It's about acknowledging our spiritual bankruptcy. bankruptcy. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it means that we invite Christ in and, and in his power to work in us, transforming our lives by faith and grace. That develops the righteousness in us, the righteousness that we hunger and thirst for, and that, so with which we will be filled. So the Pharisees, it seems, have the wrong kind of righteousness in mind. Theirs seems to be based on the scribal demands of the Mishnah, um, compiled in the third century, but the regulations were in effect long before that date. If this is their righteousness, which Jesus is be betraying as inadequate because it fails to acknowledge the true heart of the law, pointing to, to dependence on God and obedience to his commands, not their traditions and so on, then the righteousness he is condemning is the wrong kind of righteousness. Therefore, when he is demanding greater righteousness from his disciples, it's not a greater accuracy or comprehensiveness in keeping the rules that he's after, but a changed attitude to obedience to his commands. Jesus is not against the law, but against the externalism added to it. So the big question is what kind of righteousness does Jesus have in mind here? And it's to be that that exceeds, surpasses that of the Pharisees in the teachers of the law. Uh, you could translate that as much, much better than. Because Jesus, his own life exceeded that of the, the, his own righteousness exceeded that of the Pharisees, even though to them it did not look like it. In fact, it looked like the opposite. He seemed to say the wrong thing, certainly hung out with the wrong people. But it was precisely the, that behavior that was righteousness not what the Pharisees thought righteousness was.
And we can surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees in that kind, in that way, in that mode. We can do that. Hang out with the wrong people, say the wrong things, except that they are consistent with Christ-likeness. Heart change ultimately is the issue. As Franz says, Jesus is not talking about beating the scribes and Pharisees at their own game, but about a different level of uh, or concept of righteousness altogether. Now, to the average Jewish person of the day, the people who studied and taught the law most accurately and the people who lived the law most devotedly were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, Jesus opposes them, not because of their devotion to the law, but because they were the standard that they held themselves up to, to the common people, and that's what the common people thought the standard was. Jesus needed to make sure they were looking at him for a proper interpretation of righteousness, rather than to those who were, in their eyes, held up as models of righteousness, but indeed were not. So it begs the question, uh, who do we look to for our standards of righteousness? Do we look to other people, inspiring as they may be, or do we look to Jesus directly? Disciples of Jesus should do that. That's one thing for us to think about. Mate, poor old Pharisees, they got a bit of a hammering. They, their problem was they, they, uh, they, looked at the, they dealt with the external rather than the interior. They had a greater concern for the ceremonial than the moral. They elevated man-made rules rather than direct biblical commands. Indeed, they often contradicted and they would hold on to the man-made rules. They seemed self-satisfied with their own righteousness and they neglected love, which was in fact the heart of the law. Lloyd Jones says this, the trouble with the Pharisees were that they were interested in details rather than principles, that they were interested in actions rather than motives, and that they were interested in doing rather than being. The remainder of this Sermon on the Mount is just an exposition of that. In conclusion, a couple of rewriting examples of how these verses might be um, explained by writing them differently, we could say. So, first of all, R.T. France in his Today's New Testament commentary. He sort of rewrites the verses like this. What do you think about this? I have, not come aside, I have not come to set aside the Old Testament, but to bring the fulfillment to which it pointed. For no part of it can ever be set aside, but all must be fulfilled, as it is now being fulfilled in my ministry and teaching. So, a Christian who repudiates any part of the Old Testament is an inferior Christian. The consistent Christian will be guided by the Old Testament and will teach others accordingly. But a true, a truly Christian attitude is not the legalism of the scribes and Pharisees, but a deeper commitment to do the will of God, as my teachings following on from here will illustrate. That's one of his quotes. And I'll give, bring you again another quote from R.T. France from a different commentary. This is the New International Commentary on the New Testament. I rather like this too. It's kind of a retranslation and interpretation of those verses. See what you think of this one. Do not suppose that I came to undermine the authority of the Old Testament scriptures and in particular the law of Moses. I did not come to set them aside, but to bring into reality that to which they pointed forward. I tell you truly, the law, down to its smallest details, is as permanent as heaven and earth and will never lose its significance. On the contrary, all that it points forward to will in fact become a reality and is now doing so in my ministry. So, anyone who treats even the most insignificant of the commandments of the law as of no value and teaches other people to belittle them is an unworthy representative of the new regime. While Anyone who takes them seriously in word and deed will be a true member of God's kingdom. But do not imagine that simply keeping all those rules will bring salvation. For I tell you truly, it is only those whose righteousness of life goes far beyond the old policy of literal rule keeping, which the scribes and Pharisees represent, who will prove to be God's true people in this era of fulfilment. I really like those summaries. I wonder what you think about them. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. I don't think I've answered every question because I don't have an answer to all the questions. But I do hope you found Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19, 20 uh, interesting, helpful. This is all background, really, for the class that starts on Friday, or the next class on Friday, about the, the following section of Matthew 5, really, which is focused on relationships and how does the teaching of Jesus shape the way that we treat our enemies, those we have a difficulty with, um, and our, our, our marriages and all kinds of things. So that's what we'll be looking at uh, 
this coming Friday. I hope you've found this useful. I hope it's not too technical. I know it's more technical than most of the things I've been posting in these classes, but now and again, you've got to try something a little bit more deep, a little more um, intense in some ways. Uh, and I would like to know what you think. And any questions you have, send them my way. You can email me, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. You can post a comment wherever you see or hear this recording. And I hope to see you Friday. And if not, then please watch the videos and listen to the, the classes and, and read the notes. And I hope that all of this at least enriches not only your Bible study, but enriches your relationship with God. That it, it enrich, enriches the way that you, you think about Jesus and how to live for him as one of his followers. So until the next time, take care and God bless.